The Small Business Show, episode 158 for Wednesday, February 14th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Small Business Show here at businessshow.co, the show by, for, and about small business owners. Sponsors for this episode include... Text Expander. We're at textexpander.com slash podcast. You get 20% off for your first year. And Jamf. We're at Jamf, J A M F dot com slash S B S. You get your first three devices free for life here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Lafayette, California, I'm Shannon Jean. That's a mouthful, Dave. Hey, you know, you did, you it's what good. I do. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You have a lot of experience. <laughs> I do. That's awesome. Yeah, arguably too much. That's right. <laughs> That's all right. It's good to have lots of experience. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. At least a good thing. So, hey, um, we've got a great guest on the show today, and I want to jump right in because we have a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, so, we recently had uh, Jari Bolander and uh, Mahir Shah on the Small Business Show. We, we discussed Jari's book, right? The Entrepreneur Ethos, yep. which is cool. We just I have a signed copy sitting next to my bed. It's awesome. Same. Uh, yep. Yeah, but when we were on the show, we uh, realized as soon as we hung up with uh, these two awesome guys, we said, man, we need to have uh, Mahir back on the show. He's got a lot of good stuff to talk about. So Mahir, uh, welcome back to the Small Business Show. Thanks for joining us today. Dave, Shannon, thanks for uh, having me. Uh, excited to uh, share and impart whatever knowledge I have to you guys and your uh, uh, constituents and your awesome. listeners. Uh, yes, wisdom. That's right. I, I, yeah, I spent a lot of time on your LinkedIn profile this morning, so it's. I think it's definitely wisdom that you. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, Mahir, he's got an extensive background. You know, helping to manage, acquire, invest in, and sell businesses. You know both small and large. So uh, I know our listeners are going to, uh, will learn a lot from you. So we're really happy to have you back. And what, I, what I'd like to do is uh, take you back to the beginning where a lot of uh, folks are maybe right now. And, you know, maybe, maybe not your first business venture, but what, what really got you, uh, you know, jazzed up and started the spark to get you going in the, in the business world. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, you know, a couple things, uh, you know, sure. funny enough, my, you know, my, my background, at least from an education standpoint was, was, was in the life sciences. Um, so my, my father's a physician. And so growing up, you know, the only thing I knew was, Hey, you know, we're got to go be a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, my junior year, I think in college, it was, um, my dad set me up with an internship with a, um, a cancer specialist out of Southern California and um, thinking, hey, this is great. I got an internship. Most like med school students get, you know, couldn't get this hook up. I'd say probably in the first 48 hours, I realized that that career was not for me. Um, uh. <laughs> I, you know, was in front of a cadaver, like looking at, you know, blood and guts. And I said, you know what, dad, I appreciate what you guys do. And I appreciate uh, uh, what doctors do, but this career choice is absolutely not for me. And, uh, wow. and so then, then kind of began, you know, the journey right over there. Sure. Sure. Wow. Well, that, that's good. You, you uh, learned that early on. <laughs> I can see how it uh, being presented with a cadaver would give you a very efficient way to evaluate your future. So there very it's efficient. Very I walked efficient. into that room and I smelled that smell and I was like, I am done. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's okay. it. But that's like, that's it. No, I mean, I, mean, that's huge. I mean, funny enough, funny enough. I took the MCATs, you know, got into med school, all those things. And I said, you know what? Not going. Yeah, but wow. that's huge. Like people go yeah. like you, you, you know, I meet people sometimes my age that are like, yeah, you know, I realized I went into the wrong profession. It's like, well, you had to that sure. right off at the pass. That's good. And and how was I mean, you know, must have been tough maybe for your, your folks or your dad as, uh, you know, not kind of following those footsteps. They, they took it OK and supported you. You know, actually, my dad was uh, extremely supportive. And so, you know, awesome. my father's the only physician in actually a long line of business people. So it was, you know, very kind of well receptive. Get it, uh, understand. Uh, Mom was a little bit, dis you know, disappointed. Uh, yeah, I think I turned out okay. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So, you know, as I mentioned, for much of your career, you've been involved in, you know, mergers, acquisitions, and you know, we talk a lot. We've been talking about the last. I don't know, maybe five or six months about selling your business and different things that go on. We've had some guests come on that have sold their companies. Uh, you know, 
during your time, uh, you know, of doing this and analyzing, you know, what stands out as, uh, or is there one thing that stands out as the most critical part of making an acquisition, you know, successful, bringing together two companies? Yeah, a couple things. So first and foremost, there's got to be a product market fit for the company that you are acquiring, right? So, uh, you know, did a ton of deals at IBM as well as Brocade. And the ones that separated the ones that were successful and unsuccessful were whether or not there's actually a a market for the product that you're building. And so, you know, you know, the other interesting thing we did at IBM was we actually did a study of the 200 or so acquisitions that we had done uh, uh, over, you know, the previous 10 years that I was there. And the ones that actually were most successful was, Hey, we, we got a product, we're solving a problem and customers are actually paying for this product. And the ones where we invested in or bought companies that were kind of science projects where we thought the technology was really cool and maybe it would help turned out to be, you know, kind of non-starters and just did not get the traction, even with a large company's sales force. So that's one thing. The second thing, culture. I mean, I can't stress enough about this, right? The, uh, the company that you're acquiring has to have a similar, similar cultural fit, or you have to assess really quickly whether that team that's going to come on board can adapt to your culture uh, because, you know, change is a little bit difficult. And if, if you sure. get that, that whiff of, Hey, these guys are just going to continue to do what they're doing and not really going to be a part of this overall mission that we're trying to go accomplish. It's a pretty, pretty quick deal killer. Um, you know, the unfortunate part is, you know, you get this whole, um, uh, steamroll effect of when a deal happens and, you know, all the executives and all the deal sponsors within the large organization just want to go get it done. Always like to take a step back and say, Hey, does this make sense from a cultural standpoint? Because if it doesn't, it's just going to be a disaster. You might have a trophy that you acquired a company, but at the end of the day, there's going to be no revenue and no synergies associated with it. So th- those are kind of the two things that I, I am very very keen on. No, that's great. Uh, that, that's really helpful. Uh, so I have questions about both things on the, on the product uh, aspect of it. So, you know, these kind of, you call them kind of science projects where you thought, Hey, this is a good technology. It'd be great. Uh, but if it you know didn't come to fruition, w- would your focus then be on, you know, how do we preserve this talent and, you know, this, t- this group that we bought that can help doing other things or, or you know, is, is there some effort spent at, at trying to uh, turn around something maybe that didn't work out right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, you, you, you know, you, you've paid a handsome sum for, for, for an asset now and it's, it's not working out. Uh, and, and hopefully the, the, the team that sponsored this deal, right. At, at the larger company can figure out uh, how you can incorporate technology pieces within that acquisition to make a complete solution to compete against your competitors or take that team and rapidly develop uh, an adjacent uh, product that we can go sell through our channel. And, 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 you know, even taking a role, you know, to take a step back on this at the end of the day, this is really a sales game, right? It's right. taking this thing out to market, positioning it correctly and having your sales force go put it, you know, in the hands of your customers. So, uh, so, I'm curious from the standpoint of someone being acquired, you know, if you like, like what are some of the signs that, uh, that your new, you know, hopefully benevolent overlords and, and acquirers, (laughs) uh, are, are perhaps feeling a little bit of the post-purchase blues, right? I mean, because I feel like, you know, if, if you've been, you know, your company's been acquired, you're, you're part of that team, you know, there's a long-term uh, involvement stretch for you, you, you kind of want to know, like, how are, you know, you, you want to know those signs before somebody comes to you and says, this isn't working, y- you know, especially if there's maybe some upside to the deal for you, if things work well. So are there, are there any things that, that might be good sort of m- metrics or warning signs for somebody to say, Oh wait, maybe I can be the, I can take the the lead here and step up and say, Hey, is this working the right way? You know, what, what, what might some of those things be? Yeah. So first and foremost, every time a large company, you know, and, and we'll just use public companies, right. Sure. Uh, as, as, uh, as kind of the, the, the acquirer, you know, when they're putting together a, a business case to go and, and acquire a business, that business case incorporates, 
uh, incremental revenue, right? That that uh, that that target will generate as a part of a larger organization. It'll uh, you know it'll have a hiring plan as a part of it. Uh, synergies, you know, in terms of hey, you know what? Maybe we don't need all the salespeople that are coming with this organization, and we can you know use our existing salespeople. And then there's metrics aligned to all those, and so they have these kind of broader integration teams at these larger companies that are monitoring the progress based on the initial business case that was presented. So the incentive is for the, for the sponsor who sponsored this deal within a large organization to, um, to make those metrics, to either make those metrics or figure out if they're not making them, how, um, you know, how they can evolve that asset that they've acquired. So there are definite metrics in there, right? So my, you know, my thing, you know, if it's a small company that again, doesn't really have a product, you know, the metric is, Hey, you, you told us that the pro this product was ready to go. How come it's taken, you know, so long to get, you know, developed. Uh, so there's a product milestone kind of metric and then there's financial metrics, right? And so you kind of scorecard these on a monthly basis to see where, where we are in terms of what we said we were going to go do. Interesting. Yeah, because yeah, that that's like yeah. a different mindset than a lot of small businesses, especially in, you know, startup realm. Like you said, if they don't even have a product, yes, you have these milestones, but you also, you know, you're just kind of doing everything and, and running as fast as you can toward the finish line. And now someone has defined when and where that finish line is. And and so, you know, for someone coming in, wrapping your head around, well, this there's a new way to do things now or a new way to look at things now. That could be a really helpful uh, and, and a new accountability, the new right? accountability. Right. It's not just yeah. especially if you were the CEO and yep. if you were the CEO and the chief engineer on the project and, you know, all those other things. Yeah. Understanding right. what they need from you and and what they don't need from you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and what these large companies are, are 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 great at is 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 process, right? Process is you know instrumental in making these large behemoths run. And coming from a you know a smaller company, uh, it's difficult to adhere to those because you're not used to that process, right? right? You're calling the shots. You're like, hey, this is this is the one metric I care about. It, but in reality, these larger companies are looking at you know multiple different metrics. And if one of those red flags goes off, you better believe that the deal sponsor is getting a phone call saying, Hey, you know, we just spent $200 million on this asset. Why, why are we not, you know, generating what we said we were going to go generate? Oh yeah. That's, uh, that's fascinating. I, and, and I'm sure it can be difficult. And, and I also think it to come to part to my next question about culture, uh, you know, that, that process culture and maybe, you know, a little more control, higher levels of accountability. Uh, and, and like you said earlier, change is really difficult. Are, are there, uh, you know, things that there are methods that uh, you found uh, to get people to embrace that change during those kinds of transition to help them, uh, you know, succeed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, the, you know, and again, we're, we're going to take the acquirer and, and target uh, uh, monikers over here. Uh, whoever the sponsor at the acquirer is, I mean, he or she has to lay down the vision of what that business unit is going to go do and, and how this new asset is going to go help achieve ultimate goal. And so, you know, if you have that crystallized and you're able to communicate that to the new team, uh, you know, I think you, you, you get rid of a lot of these obstacles that typically happen where it tends to fall apart is where there's kind of miscommunication. And so you kind of go back into the deal process. This is why I think it's extremely important for both target and acquire to spend a lot of time together, where it be with dinners, coffees, whatever it is yeah. really to get to know that person, because the worst thing is, Hey, I, you know, I want to do a deal just to do a deal. I go buy a company and I don't know who these people are and I don't know how they're going to go integrate that. That's just a recipe for disaster. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great. That's very cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll just give you one example. I mean, at Brocade, we, you know, we acquired a company, um, uh, you know, the company was a small company with, you know, very little revenue. We ended up paying, you know, let's say 18, $19 million for it. But even before we got to that point, uh, you know, I spent a ton of time with the founder just to make sure his, the way he operated, the way his, you know, he, you know, he treated his employees was very much aligned with how, you know, 
and, and, and what Brocade did, because I kind of knew that if we didn't do that, it was just going to be a difficult challenge. And, uh, and you know, it, it, everything worked out and it worked out so well that, um, we were able to even get concessions out of him from pricing because I got him to a point to feel that, Hey, look, being a part of this, you're going to be, uh, you know, not only are you going to have greater responsibility within a larger organization, but you're going to be able to call the shots in the Valley on your next endeavor. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, oh, there's this, yeah. you're right. It's a sales pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Total sales pitch. Yeah. yeah. Total sales pitch. Oh, but that's but uh, but not I mean, not BS like that's actually true. If if this acquisition is a successful thing for Brocade, then that person could call the shots on their next deal for sure. Yeah, And, and, and so and, and so what I go back to is instead of sitting across the table on someone on a, you know, negotiating with bring them on your side and align those kind of common goals and objectives. You'll be, you know, your probability of success will be a lot higher. But again, that's just kind of my style. There are companies out there that are large companies. Their style is completely different, right? Sure. We buy you. You're going to do what we're going to do. And, uh-huh. and, 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 and that's how it is. Yeah, you it know, seems like we, the best way to go. We talk about that concept of sitting on the same side of the table in many different scenarios, it, all the way down to, you know, like the lone wolf consultant that's out there helping somebody fix their printer. It's like you, you need to be on the same side of the table. Otherwise, you've just entered into an uh, unprofitable adversarial relationship. <laughs> so yeah. absolutely. And, and I always tell I always tell people use the term we, you know, yeah. not not near use we. Right. It's just something some something little as that can make a huge difference. That's oh, it totally makes sense. Yeah, that's great. The power of we, you know, the power yeah, of yeah. we. Oh, I like, I it. like it. All right. Yeah. Hey, Shannon, I want to like a book title. It does. Yeah, sound like that does book. sound. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to take uh, about two and a half minutes here, Mahir and Shannon, and talk about our two sponsors. Shannon, you want to take the yeah. first one? All right. You're absolutely. Up, man. Let, let's talk about text expander. Now, this is a real easy one for me because I love talking about products that have literally changed my life. Uh, you know, as small business owners, we're often limited on resources and staff. You want to look good, uh, but you maybe don't have enough people. Text expander makes your business message clear and consistent across your team, and it also speeds up your communication at the same time. So I've been using Text Expander literally forever. Uh, I use it for myself every single day and I and with my employees because I'm really kind of obsessed about all of them having the same message, the same story, if you will, for uh, whatever business I'm dealing with. And I want them to use the same ta- tactics, provide the same kind of customer service, no matter who the customer works with. So Text Expander allows me to be up at night creating snippets for how I want responses to be handled uh, and share them across the team. So uh, micromanaging the right way. Yeah, because then they don't really know I'm up at 2 a.m., you know, saying, oh, say it this way, say it that way, you know, but it, it works great. So uh, the for our awesome small business show subscribers, you can save 20 percent off your first year subscription to Text Expander by going to textexpander.com slash podcast. That's right. Textexpander.com slash podcast. And we'll put it in the show notes to save 20 percent. Go now and then come back and tell us how much you love it, because I know you will. There you go. And our thanks to Smile and Text Expander for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for this episode is Jamf at J-A-M-F dot com slash S-B-S, where you can get your first three devices for free for life in Jamf's awesome mobile device management system. Jamf Is that forever? It is forever. Wow. Truly is. Cool. Yeah. Three devices for free for life. After that, it's two bucks a month per device. But the first three are always free. You never like once you start paying, you never pay for those first three. You know it. And the way it works is, you know, it's pretty easy to keep track of your own Mac, your own iPad, your own iPhone. But once you start growing a little bit, there's a lot of other devices in your organization that maybe you can't touch, like maybe your remote salesperson's. Uh, iPad or something or or their MacBook, right? You may not even like that may not even be in your office regularly. So how can you possibly control it? Well, with Jamf now, it does it all remotely and you can check real time inventory. You can configure things like Wi-Fi and email settings. You can deploy applications. You can protect sensitive company data. You can do all kinds of things remotely and no IT experience is needed for Jamf now. And like I said, small business show listeners, you visit Jamf, J-A-M-F dot com slash S-B-S to get 
your first three devices for free forever. There's no hook to this. Trust me on it. It's pretty cool. I've tested it out myself. Jamf.com slash SBS. Our thanks to Jamf for sponsoring this episode. I think between my my wife, my kids, and my parents, <laughs> I probably need this for my house. <laughs> I use it. I, th- yeah, there have been times when I've used it for my house, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. awesome. All right, you want to take great. us uh, take us on to the next one, man? Yeah, uh, Mahir, thanks for uh, letting us pay the bills there. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, So what I want to do now, let's condense your your 20 plus years uh, of of business experience and jump ahead to how you arrived at Drobo. Can can you give us a little bit of background of what, for folks that don't know what Drobo does, and then how you got involved uh, with the company and ultimately became CEO? Sure. So, uh, you know, Drobo manufactures and designs uh, data storage appliances, uh, primarily targeting small business as well as creative professionals. And, you know, our value proposition is really around storage easy for everybody, right? Uh, We know people are starting to move to cloud and doing those types of things. But at the end of the day, this is a a cost effective solution, even more cost effective in the cloud for small business and creatives to house their data. Uh, you know, within their four walls and, you know, our, our network attached devices act kind of as your private cloud. So you can access those devices uh, from any of your mobile devices, laptops, PCs or, or, or a web browser. Nice. So that's that's kind of Drobo. Uh, you know how I got involved. It's really interesting. So um, I uh, was approached, I'd say, about um, early 2015, uh, where um, Drobo being put on the block or to get sold. And, um, uh, you know, a good friend of mine is a, a, a banker who is representing Drobo. And my former boss actually sat on the board of Drobo's um, uh, parent company, which was Connected Data. And, uh, you know, got approached saying, hey, here's an opportunity to, um, you know, get involved in a, in a company that's got a great brand thing is you got to go raise money to go buy it. Right. Uh, and you got two weeks to go do it. (laughs) And so, uh, and so, you know, discussions progress. This was in a kind of, I think it was around April timeframe, uh, mid April ish, somewhere around there. Uh, so, uh, you know, got on the phone, called, uh, several people that I knew, uh, you know, I was willing to go and lead the organization um, and we were able to close the financing in you know, a few short weeks and bought the business. Right. So, wow. you know, we partnered with a couple That's of private awesome. equity firms to go do it. So, it was, yeah, it was fast. Um, you know, I literally we closed the deal. Uh, I want to say at 1155 p.m. on a Friday night where I was actually supposed to be at a, at a family wedding function and I had. 40 texts from family members asking me where I am. Like everything's getting started. Oh, wow. um, but you know, that's, that's kind of how it is, right? You guys know how yeah, the small business absolutely. world works. Yeah. Uh, but it's, all right. So, you know, kind of the lesson that I've learned from all this, like, you know, make sure you have a great network, right? These opportunities come, uh, you know, very, you know, far and few between and, uh, you know, capitalize on them. You got to, you know, pull the umbilical cord, as I always say. Yeah, that makes sense. We talk about a lot here too, you know, networking and uh, making those connections. That, that, that's wow, awesome. That, what is that? Is that timing abnormal? Like the you know, you've got two weeks. If you want it, like go find money. Let's go. It's going to happen now. Is that is that pretty common? Or no, this one was a little out of the ordinary. I honestly feel it's common for me. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. I, I, I've always been in situations where it's always. Uh, uh, you know, you got two or three weeks to go get this done or else, you know, it's going to blow up. Uh, I always make the comment, you know, you know, I don't know. Crap always blows up when, when I'm either out of the office or I need to get things done. Um, oh, you know, for, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, for it's, sure. it's, it's kind of a good motivator too, right? It's, it's, you know, you work super, super hard to go get it done and, and it, and it, you know, you get it across the finish line. There are times where, you know, in my previous career where, you know, I've been on the other side, you know, buying business for a large entity that obviously takes a a longer time because, you know, the, again, the acquirer has a balance sheet. Uh, You're kind of waiting to get the small company in a position where you can go in for the kill, you know, they're low on cash and those types of things. So those deals typically take three, four, five months to close. 
Got it. Okay. Yeah. That yeah, that makes, makes sense. sense. But you know, it like we say all the time here, time kills all deals. And so to to be able to go to some uh you know, some equity or or someone who's gonna provide you with capital to do this and say, I've got this deal, if they get excited about it, well, good news, because you gotta sign the check next week. You, you yep. know, there's no time to to think too much about this or to have something else distract you from this. Like we're just going to do it or not. And I need to know today because otherwise I got to call the next person on my list. So, yep. Yeah, I mean, it's, right. it, and that's what it was. Right. I, I mean, I have for it is dialing for dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Wow. That's a, that's a great story. So when, when you came on board and, and now we get to the, the, Part of the show, which I always, you know, I call the problem solving uh, section. So managing crisis and things like often when businesses are sold, there's problems that need to be solved. When you came aboard uh, to Drobo, did you have to jump right into, you know, solving any critical problems right away? Uh, What went on there? So, again, uh, crisis, I I think my brand is crisis. Uh, (laughs) That's good. That's a good brand to have. (laughs) uh, I, I. You know, there's there's crisis every day. Right. Um, uh, And we had crisis yesterday. Right. So uh, I think the most critical um, uh, thing that a uh, person like myself or someone who's looking to uh, acquire a business, um, you know, you really got to assess what are kind of the key components in the in the business drivers of the business. And, you know, for a hardware company, the most important thing is supply. Right. If you don't have supply, you have zero revenue. And we had a situation where the contract manufacturer at that time, uh, you know, you know, Drobo had a large outstanding balance due to them. So the first and first thing that we had to do was hop on a flight to Asia and show these guys, you know, the business plan and what we're going to go achieve. And we needed their partnership uh, to to go do it. So um, that was probably, I would say the biggest crisis is if we weren't going to get that done, then, you know, we weren't going to go do the deal. So we actually, actually pre-negotiated that before the deal actually closed. Say, Hey, Mm. if we pay you X of what we owe you, will you continue to uh, build products for us? Um, And, you know, it was, you know, fortunately it worked out really well. That's great. Yeah. That sounds like a critical, critical part of things to make sure you've you don't want to do the deal, walk in on Monday morning and then realize that. Oh, yeah. yeah and, you don't have a business. Know. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And, and you know, the, you know, the other thing that we realized was, you know, the, the, the OPEX, what I called operational expenses for this business, were completely uh, bloated, right? They were very much driven by a classic Silicon Valley startup that's been funded a ton of money and they can go spend on, you know, whatever the heck they wanted to do. So we had to go line item by line item and it took a long time to figure out where we can and get to an OPEX level that, you know, got us to a point that was, you know, somewhat comfortable. And I always tell people the way to kind of do that is go find a public company in your industry, see what their revenues are and what their expense to revenue ratios are for each line item and try to budget, plan your budget according to that. So, so for example, if I'm making a hundred dollars, if I'm a big company and I'm, and they, they, their revenue is a hundred dollars and they're spending $20 in sales and marketing, make sure your sales and marketing budget is 20% of your revenue. That's how you become really efficient. Uh, Yeah. That's a great idea. Wow. What a great tip. That's that, a great you know, tip, whether you're acquiring yeah. somebody or if you just have a business that you kind of want to wrangle under control just for yourself. That's wow. Yeah. yeah I love it. That's very cool. Huh? Uh, yeah. So that's good. What I like also is your, your comment, you know, my brand is crisis. I mean, you're right. We're always, uh, I mean, you can't run around like your hair's on fire. You just kind of have to embrace it and go, okay, here, line them up and let's knock them down. You know? And, and uh, I think that's a, a really uh, smart thing. That's cool. So l- let me ask another one. We always ask all our guests this, uh, you know, staying on the topic of problem solving. We're big fans of mistakes and the small business shows since they uh, tend to learn. We learn a lot uh, from them, you know, often on the, the hard way. But can you share with us a mistake that you made during your career? It doesn't have to be a Drobo, but something that's really stuck with you as a, a major learning experience. Um, yeah, and I, I'll kind of go back to Drobo. Um, you know, like I said, hard. I, I underestimated how difficult a hardware business is, um, you know, is to run. So, you know, you, you know, everybody goes in with these, um, 
rosy uh, projections, you know, into any sure. endeavor, you know, we're going to be a yeah. company. Uh, but I think I kind of go back to, you know, understand what your business drivers are and, um, you know, Right. And I'd say the biggest mistake that I made was really underestimating how important that supply chain is, because when you have, you know, 10 or 15,000 components that make up your product, any slippage in one piece of that, that supply chain can really, you know, impact your business. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, we found out that the manufacturer of a small spring device, um, you know, doesn't want to bid on our business anymore for a reason right so that's going to delay our ability to get a product and it's a small spring it's about a two centimeter size spring that goes into our product not even an electrical component just a spring wow and so um so again i kind of you know i kind of go back to know your business know your business drivers and and you're gonna make mistakes right i make mistakes on a daily basis right personal what, you know, whatever it is, right. Personal business mistake. It's just how quickly can you adapt to it and how, how, how you know, can't you, and only you, your team as well, right. You've got to have a good team who's able to navigate, you know, through this change and be able to take a deep breath and say, Hey, you know what, we're going to find a way We're we're, we're going to find a way. Yeah. No, that's great. So would you say that that's your biggest challenge at Drobo is managing that supply chain? I chain. I mean, again, everything's a challenge here, right? Uh, right. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're moving buildings, you know, we are, um, you know, we're ramping up a new contract manufacturer right now. Uh, you know, we have um, uh, a couple of salespeople just left for so we're kind of hiring new people. Again, like I said, my brand is crisis, right? It's yeah. how you get through it. You, you know, we had a situation where we had a little bit of a cash crunch, Right. And so how do we navigate, you know, do you stretch, stretch out vendors, do you get incremental capital, you know, those types of things. And, you know, we're in the midst of doing a big capital raise right now. And so, um, again, it's, it's like I said, I've probably had it in the last two years. Yeah, that's great. It's problem solving though. Right. And just, and and that's what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I said this on your show last time, somebody in this world has encountered your problem and that's why a network is extremely important. And, you know, whether you go put it on LinkedIn or whether you go to any networking organization you belong to, Hey, I've had this issue with my contract manufacturer. What do I do? Chances are I probability that someone else has encountered that. So use that to your advantage because you can't figure it out on your own, right? You're going to, you're going to shoot yourself in the head trying to be, Hey, why is this happening to me? You know what? It's happened to several people, several thousands of people use harness the, you know, harness the power of crowdsourcing knowledge to be able to get you to your answer a lot faster. Yeah, that's a great tip, especially for entrepreneurs or small business owners that are often, you know, maybe this lone wolf mentality that, oh, look, I'm going to solve, I'm going to, you know, solve this problem and and uh, maybe not reach out to get help. So I think that's, that's real important. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think you got to be self-aware, right? First and foremost is, hey, I don't have the answers to everything, right? And you being the CEO or the owner of your business, your team and your employees are constantly like, Oh, this guy must know everything or this gal must know everything. No, you know, it's we, what we try to do is we try to invest in people who do. And if we don't, we extend out to our network to say, Hey, here's the issue that I'm having. And and I'm telling you every single time I've done that, I've gotten a solution. Yeah, that's cool. That's brilliant. So I've, I've loved having you on the show with some really just awesome tidbits of, you know, information that are some great tips for business owners of, of any size. So uh, I want to wrap it up. I want to, I want to again, bring you back to the beginning, kind of where we started. If, if you could go back to when you were just getting started on your, you know, awesome business career, is there a critical piece of advice that you would give yourself uh, based on your knowledge now? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I continue learning, right. At the end of the day, this, this whole, you know, things that we do are, are a journey. And, you know, I, I have friends that have been in the same job in the same big company for 15, 20 years. And, 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 and that's fine. That's, that's what they enjoy. And it's their means to an end to whatever other passion that they may have. But, you know, I kind of chose this path. And for those listeners that you have, they've probably chosen a similar path as, as myself and, and you guys is, I always be excited that, Hey, 
something new. You wouldn't be doing this if you, you know, if you didn't want to learn and, and, and grow as a person. And so that's where kind of the growth mindset really comes into play. And I think people who embrace uh, learning, who embrace change, um, you know, are going to be successful in, 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 in small business. Here, here. I agree. <laughs> I think yeah. you agree too, Dave. <laughs> no, totally. It, like yeah, you, you yeah. have to, if, if you expect things to be the same tomorrow as they are today, you're wrong. And if you feel yeah. like things are the same today as they were yesterday, it's because you've become complacent. Like watch out for either one of those mindsets because it's, it's, you are definitely wrong. And it means somebody else has momentum that you don't have. So, ah. That's true. Yeah. Well, my here, we've loved having you on the show again. Uh, what's the best way for people to learn more about uh, Drobo and your products? Sure. So, uh, you know, our website, www.drobo.com, uh, you know, has plethora of information on our products. We're also on uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all the kind of social platforms, uh, you know, go and follow us and, you know, you'll see kind of our story. It's, I think it's really unique. It's, and it's, I think it's going to be one of the true telling tel turnaround stories of, of, of the Valley. That's awesome. Thank you so much for spending, uh, you know, your time with us today. It's I've learned a lot and I know all of our listeners will as well. I really appreciate it. Very cool. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks me here. I appreciate you coming back and, and all of that. It's very, very cool stuff, man. Shannon, that, uh, that about does it for me. You good? I'm good, man. All right. Well, folks, we will see you next week. And uh, keep living that charmed life. 